Welcome to Wednesdays in the Word. It's good to have everybody this evening. Pray you're blessed. Pray you're well. Uh, what an amazing Sunday we had. Um, we were we were worshiping outside. We had the great word uh, from the Lord on on the outside. The weather was a little bit, eh, but yeah, that's all right. We can still worship the Lord no matter what the weather is. Um, Want to just you know, welcome you this evening and pray you're well on this Wednesday. Uh, last week we had a, a special announcement that the Lord just laid on my heart, and we kind of skipped away from our from our Ephesians um, study. But I wanted to jump back in tonight. And if we have your Bible, we're going to be in Ephesians uh, chapter two, and we're going to start at um, the verse that uh, I think we're I think we ended up with verse ten is where we ended up. Excuse me, verse eleven is where we'll start tonight. And so. Um, but just as a re quick recap, we, we've been looking at, in Ephesians 2, we've been looking at the, uh, if my computer would act right, we've been looking at God's way of reconciliation. You know, the need of the reconciliation that we have, uh, why we need it. Um, we've been looking at where Paul was talking about the life of death and, and, and how we used to fulfill the desires of the flesh, and we no longer do that, um, being that we are re reconciled with Christ. And we get all the way to the, the, the process of personal reconciliation in verse 4, God's motive for reconciliation. And we talked about our past and our present and our future of how God has individually re reconciled us and how we were dead in our trespasses and we're made alive in Christ by the grace that he has given. Um, and then it, as he finishes up here and, and we look at the, the verse 11, we kind of look, speaking more of reconciliation, um, we look at the reconciliation of the Jews and the Gentiles in Jesus, right? Uh, the need of reconciliation of Gentile and Jew. And so verse 11 says this, that therefore remember that you, once Gentiles in the flesh, who were called uncircumcision by what is called circumcision, made in the flesh by hands, that at that time you were without Christ being aliens from commonwealth of Israel and strangers from covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. Let's open in prayer. Lord, I thank you, Father, for this night. I thank you for this Bible study. I ask your blessing upon it. I ask your anointing upon it. Lord, I ask that you would just have your way and open our hearts to receive as we study your word in depth tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. So what's Paul saying here? Basically, he's saying that, you know, he basically he says, you want Gentiles in the flesh. So, you know, God's work of reconciliation is not just between God and us or God and the individual. Um, it, it must begin there. That's, that's, that's very true. But it's also between groups of people that are at odds, such as the Jews and the Gentiles were in the days of Paul. I think this is a great study for a specific time as we stand today. Our nation is standing in, in complete race division. Uh, we stand in a site where we're black versus white or, you know, Latino versus this, that, and the other. And it's, it's color of skin, you know, um, and cultures. It's unfortunate. Um, I've said this before, and I, I will say this till I die. And, and I understand that there is, there is evils and there's total, you know, situations that are downcast on on many people, um, minority or not minority. But I know this, that when I cut myself, the blood that drips from my, my cut is red. It's the same color of blood when, when a person of color cuts himself or herself, whether they be black or Latino or brown or, or white, it doesn't matter. We all bleed red. We all are the same. We all, the Bible says, were created equal in, before with, by God. And so we need to understand that there, there needs to be a reconciliation between the people. I understand there's an agenda. I understand there's, there's other issues pushing against that. But, but Paul is basically trying to get the Ephesians to understand, hey, there needs to be some reconciliation here between the Gentiles and the Jews. He says, you were called uncircumcision, you who were called un, uh, uncircumcision by what is called circumcision. 
You see, Gentiles back then were in a very desperate place. You know, they were being, they were called aliens. They were called strangers. They were, they had no hope and, and they were being without God. You know, Gentiles were looked upon as the lower breed. You know, the Jews were the ones that were the ones that basically had it all to themselves. You know, they, they were the, the top notch race and received the special laws of God and, and the special blessings of God. And the truth is a lot of them didn't even get it right. They weren't even living the way God requested them to live. But we see here that Paul's talking about a need, a need of reconciliation. He's showing us how the, where the Gentiles were and how low they were. And so listen, this shows that they were not only spiritually dead, but they also did not have access to God that the Jews had. They hadn't been shown the gospel. They hadn't been told about the miraculous salvation and, and miraculous resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they were without. They didn't have that hope yet given to them. And so Paul's talking about this is where you, this is where the Gentiles were. This is this is where they are. We look a little further there on that scripture. He says this. Um, well, continuing upon that, I'm sorry. Who who are called uncircumcised? Uh, Gentiles had no hope, as I mentioned. Uh, they were they were Christless. They were friendless. They were hopeless. They were godless. And Paul says this: having no hope. We've talked about having hope in, in previous sermons just not too long ago. But man, to have no hope, to know at the end of my life that when I die, there's, that that's it. I've had my certain amount of years and why I've lived here, and that's it. There is no hope for me anywhere else. Man, that would be a lousy way to live, honestly. That would be a lousy way to live. Um, have you ever gone to, I remember going to sleep as a kid and, and going to Disneyland, and I was... I, I couldn't sleep. Why? Because I was hoping that tomorrow would just hurry up and get here. There was anticipation. There was excitement. That's what we have as Christians, knowing that the last time we take a breath, we have a hope that our very next breath will be in heaven. Our very next time that we open our eyes will be in heaven with Jesus Christ. That's living with hope. The Gentiles didn't have that yet. They hadn't been told again, like I mentioned, the gospel message. They were just this being told this at you know um once peter finally took the the reins and said hey let's you know do this and paul went out and did it with them and he, they spread the word they spread the gospel to the um to the gentiles and they they but paul's talking about them here and having no hope and then he says without god in a world in the world this this is kind of just a, a little play check this out there are some people that believe in god in this world if you ask him, do you believe in God? Yes, I do. But they believe he lives in heaven or he's some man in a robe with a gray beard and a staff. And they believe that, yeah, he's real. And some they actually believe that he lives in heaven and has nothing to do with this world. He's just up there being a, you know, a, 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 just a God. In this way, a person can still believe in God and be without God in the world. So basically, they can believe there's a God, but not have him in his heart. And that's what Paul's talking about here. And then he goes on to say, without Christ. I'll tell you, that these are two very dangerous and terrible words, without Christ. Can I tell you this evening that if it wasn't, if, if it wasn't for Christ, I couldn't stand here tonight and have joy, have peace, have salvation. Without Christ, I'm dead. Without Christ, I have no hope. And so these two words are very, very terrible words. And the implications of them in the scripture are the sum of, to, to a woeful condition of a lost man or a woman. To be without Christ means to be without spiritual blessings. And we talked about that in the first chapter, how we have spiritual blessings by, by the inheritance and by being adopted by God. To be without Christ is without light. I'm not a big fan of the dark personally um I, I like light i like to be able to see where i'm going so i don't stub my toe but can you imagine living in darkness just had living in blindness all your life not knowing what direction you're going again not having hope to be without christ is without peace it, it's it's a, an ex anxious life it's a tense life it's a stressful life it's a worrisome life it's a life that is is chaotic 
without Christ mean, could mean means to be without rest. You know, we need that rest. We need that time that we can just rest our minds, rest our bodies, rest our souls. And without Christ, you can't do that. You're always going. You're always, what, what can I do to fulfill the next thing to keep myself going? To be without Christ means without safety. You know, God is protecting us. His, his angels are around us, we're told in Scripture. Jesus is protecting us. And when there's safety, when we're living for Him. It doesn't mean that we don't get bumps and bruises along the way. But we know that at the end of the day, He has us in His hands. And our times, as we've talked about in the past, our times are in His hands. To be without Christ means to be without hope. And, we, and, and that's kind of the sum of the theme that I mentioned even earlier. No hope. I, I wouldn't even imagine, I don't even want to think my life would be like with, with no hope. Um, you know, I love my wife so much. And, you know, even with the times that we're in now and, and we go to work at 7 o'clock in the morning and we kiss each other goodbye and we talk to each other throughout the day just via phone or text or what have you. But my hope is that I'll see her at 5 o'clock. And when she comes walking through the door, that hope is just exploded into joy and, and excitement because my hope was that I got to saw her, see her again anyway. And here it is. It's true. That hope is the same way in a Christian life. Again, as I mentioned, our hope is not that we live a great life and we leave a legacy. But our hope is, when this is all said and done, I've done what the Lord has called and asked me to do and I've lived the the, my, the best way I know according to his scriptures and to his will and the purpose that he has planned for my life. And now my next hope is I'm going to heaven. I have hope. I have hope that Jesus Christ is going to help me through all of the situations that I fa have to face. I have hope that he is my answer. He is the way and he is the truth as the scriptures say. You see, to be without Christ also means to be without a prophet, a priest, and a king. And we've talked about that in previous studies as well. You see, without Christ, you have nothing. The truth is, this evening, if, you, if, you're, if you're watching this study and you've caught me and, and you're just listening to just this brief moment, without Christ, you, you don't have any of these things. You may think you do. The world and the enemy is really good, and the world's really good at making you think you have all these and much more. But when you lay your head at night, do you truly have hope of where you're going to end up when this is all said and done? When you take your last breath, do you really truly know where you're going to end up? Because you, just so you know, you're not going to come back as a dog. You're not coming back as a tree. That's, that's, that's not going to happen. The Bible's very specific. When you pass away, there's heaven and hell. And if, you ha if you're without Christ, there's a hell. There's, there's a punishment. There's eternal punishment there. You know? And so... Why go to bed with no hope? Why to go to bed with no peace? Why go to bed with no joy, true joy? We need to be with Christ and Christ with us and not be without. And if you don't have that tonight, before we're, before we're done tonight, as I close in prayer, I will pray that salvation prayer with you. And you'll have an opportunity tonight to be with Christ, not without. Paul finishes up here. He says, "Aliens from the Commonwealth of Israel." This is likely separate. You know, this likely includes separated Jews as well as Gentiles. Um, there was Israelites who were outside of the Commonwealth, uh, not only as foreigners, you know, lived out there, but but as some kind of lax Jews, Jews that didn't take the Scriptures to heart. They weren't as religious Jews, and and because of that, they lost part of their covenants. Um, because they were considered foreigners, not just because they were unworthy. Gentiles, though, need to be brought to God. And Paul had this mission. Peter had this mission. Um, Gentiles are those who don't know about Jesus Christ. And Paul says this in verse 13. But now in Christ, you who were, excuse me, you who once were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Man, that, 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 that excites me. That truly excites me. Because that was me. I was far, far off. I was doing my own thing. I was drinking up a, a, a storm. I was partying up. I was living the life that Sean wanted to live. I was so far off. But I've been brought near by the blood of Christ. And Paul says, but now in Christ Jesus. 
You see those Gentiles who are now in Christ Jesus, they're no longer far off. They are made near to the things of God by the blood of Jesus Christ, which accomplishes all of this by his sacrificial death and his resurrection. And, and this coming near happens only by that blood of Christ. So remember I was talking to those who maybe don't are without Christ tonight. That's how we're saved. That's what washes away our sins. That's what makes our life right. We accept Christ into our life. That blood washes away our sins. And we are made whole. And we are brought near to God by the blood of Christ. And that sacrificial death and resurrection. It's important because Paul connects the ideas of the great love of Jesus and the sacrificial death. You know, many people think that preaching Christ crucified is all about a bloody, gory Jesus. But really the point of Christ crucified is not the gore, but it's the action of love. It's the action of him laying his life down that we might have hope, that we might have an eternal joy and an eternity with him. That's what it means to preach Jesus Christ, Jesus full of love, sacrificial, giving, and saving love. And so Paul says, by the blood of Christ. And many people suggest that different ways that, uh, to come near to God. But again, as I mentioned, the, you know, some think that they, they can keep the law. Some think you can belong to a certain group. Um, some think you can do this one time and be good and do your own thing. Um, but the only way to be brought near to God, as I mentioned earlier just a few moments ago, is by the blood of Christ. What he did on the cross, what Jesus did on the cross for us, suffering as a guilty sinner, taking my place on that cross, taking my punishment, and stood in my place, brings me near to God. It's, just a, it's a free gift of salvation for you. Jesus hung on the cross and did that for you and for myself. And verse 14 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation. Really quick, for he himself is our peace. Paul's talking about Jesus. He's talking about Jesus here, that Jesus is our peace. He hasn't simply made peace between God and man and Jew and Gentile. He is our peace. When my life's chaotic and I've got all kinds of different things going on, I, I don't go to the bottle anymore. You know, the whiskey bottle used to be my friend. It used to calm my life down. It used to bring me a sick, you know, sense of peace, right? A, a very false sense of peace. The problem was still there. I still had to deal with the problem in the morning. And, and a lot of times I'd have a headache or I'd not be up to 100% and still have to deal with the problem. Now... Jesus being my peace, I can go to him in prayer and say, Lord, I need some peace here. I need some guidance here. I need some direction. Yes, the problem's still here. God, what's the right direction? Give me peace to calm the anxiety. Give me peace to calm the stress and get me, Lord, through this problem, through this situation. Jesus is our peace. And Paul goes on to say, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation? Now see, that work that we're talking about that Jesus did on the cross is the common ground of salvation for both Jew and Gentile. Therefore, there's no longer any dividing wall between the two. Jesus broke that wall. The Jews are not are still God's people. They're still the chosen people. But because of what Christ did, we now get to share in the gospel message. We now get to share in, in receiving salvation for what Christ did for every person that has ever been born, is being born, and will be born. Christ died on the cross for them and broke that wall down of specific for our people, right? It's, it's for everybody. And Paul made it clear that in Jesus, the wall is gone. Um, this little side note, the wall of separation is gone because the, uh, the common lordship is greater than any previous division. If the lordship of Jesus Christ is not greater than any difference that you may have with somebody, may it, may it be political, uh, racial, uh, economic, language, geography, or whatever, then you truly haven't understood what it means to be under the lordship of Jesus Christ. If, if you still allow these, these differences to, to put a wall between you, 
Um, you know, America is born, you know, is a free land. Um, and I love it because I can have my own opinion about something. It may not be the right opinion, right? But it's my opinion. Uh, you can have your opinion. It may not be the right opinion. But we are free to discuss each other's opinion. What, what happens is there's a wall that's built when your opinion doesn't match my opinion. And either there's a wall built and we just never talk to each other or we get into an, a debate and an argument that's pointless a lot of times. And so if we would learn that even if you're on the other side of the political aisle or economic aisle or racial aisle for that matter, if we would learn to come together and be reconciled, right? That's what Paul's talking about here. And be reconciled and come together under the love that Jesus Christ has given and 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 paid given you know given us the opportunity to share in through salvation then we could actually talk things out we could actually hash out situations and yeah it may get tense it may get a little stressy but we need to understand that person on the other side that we're talking to that other person that has another opinion is just like me Jesus died for them he is reconciled she is reconciled to Christ as I am and so even in church board meetings or church uh, meetings, period, you see these, these arguments begin to heat up and there's division and there's, there's you know, uh, separation. And we shouldn't be like that. We should be able to handle our, you know, a, a, and have a conversation. And if it gets too heated, be able to say, hey, you know what? Let's step away. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. And, and you're saying, like, well, Sean, you're, you're talking crazy. No, really, I'm not. I'm speaking what the Lord, what, what the Word pre, you, you teaches us to be like, to be loving, to not let walls of separation uh, or division get in our way. And so that's what he's talking about here, the wall of separation. And that should be gone in our life. We shouldn't have separation dividing uh, racial or economic or language. Listen, here's what it boils down to. If we don't learn to love Christian one another, how can we love the world? If we can't love within our own church body, whether or not somebody annoys us or not, right? Because of a different, you know, economic standing or language standing or thought process standing. If we can't love them as individuals through Jesus Christ, then how can we love the world? We can't. We've got to take care of knocking any wall of separations down out of our life and just say, look, some people need a little extra teaching, a little bit of love. Some people need to be brought down a notch. And let's just let's just knock this wall of separation down and, and reconcile together and come under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. So we see here in the, in, the, in the finishing of this, For he himself is our peace, who has made both one, and has broken down the middle wall of separation, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, that is, the law of commandments contained in ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, therefore, or excuse me, thereby putting to death the enmity. You see, he says here, having abolished in his flesh. The source of contention between the Jew and the Gentile was the fact that the Gentiles did not keep the law, right? So they were lower than the Jews. But since Jesus fulfilled the law on our behalf, and since he bore the penalty for our failures and all of our sins to keep the law, you know, failure to keep the law, rather, then we are reconciled through his work on the cross, putting to death the source of the contention, right? There shouldn't be any issues now. I'm not, I'm not forced to keep a law that I can never keep the law anyway because of what Jesus Christ did for me on the cross and by the mercy and grace that which he gives me. Um, he also says this, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross. You see, Gentiles and Jews are brought together into one body, the church, where our unity is in Jesus Christ. And that unity in Jesus is far greater than our previous differences. You see, Jesus is the common denominator. He's the, he's, the, he's the one we come together for, right? We come together from all kinds of different backgrounds to serve one Lord. His name is Jesus. As we come together and we, we're reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. And Paul says, through the cross, cross, 
we see the emphasis that Paul really places on the work of Jesus in this portion of Scripture on the cross. He repeats the idea several times. He talks about made near by the blood. He talks about having abolished in his flesh. And he says in one body through the cross. Paul's really trying to help us understand here, and the Ephesians understand here, how important in the emphasis that of the work that Jesus did on the cross. It wasn't just him dying on the cross living, and, and raising from the dead three days. There's some work that was done on the cross. It was a reconciliation work. It was a bringing together work that he did on the cross for us. We're going to pause there on, on chapter, or excuse me, verse 16. We're going to catch up on 17 and continue this next week. But I want to, I want to before we close, I want to have that prayer for salvation for any who don't are without Christ. Maybe you need to be brought, reconciled with Christ. Maybe you've lived for him in the past and you've kind of stepped away and you're doing your own thing. And maybe you need to come back to him tonight. Maybe you've never had a relationship with him. Or maybe tonight you do have that relationship with him. And you just need to be reminded of why we're with him and why we are reconciled with him. So in these closing moments, if you don't know Jesus Christ or have him in your life and you're without Christ tonight, pray these words with me if you would. Lord Jesus, I thank you, Lord. I thank you for loving me in spite of myself and my mistakes, my regrets, and all of my sins, all of my flaws, Lord. And yet you still chose, because of love, to die on the cross for me. I ask, Lord God, tonight that through the blood and through the work on the cross that you would forgive me of my sins. I confess I am a sinner and that you sent your son to die on the cross for me. And Jesus, you died on that cross for me and my sins. And the blood of Christ that dripped from that, your body and from that cross, let that blood wash my sins away tonight. Let me become white as snow, as the Bible says, because I'm washed in the blood of a lamb. And Lord, I accept you as my personal Savior. Come and live within my life. Come and live within my heart and change me. Lord, I need to be changed tonight. I need to be reconciled and, and put together back with you. And I believe this and I accept this in believing faith. And I thank you in Jesus' name. And I pray for all of those tonight who may be struggling, going through issues, Lord, that you would remind us tonight through the work done on the cross that we are reconciled to you and we have hope because of you and because we are with Christ and the work that you've done on the cross for us. I give you honor and praise. I ask you to bless each one tonight that has joined us. Be with us. Go with us. And bring us Sunday, Lord, as we gather together to worship and to, re to learn more of your word. And we give you honor and praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. With that being said, God bless church and have a great evening.